and welcome to our kids service. We're so excited for you to see everything that we have for you. But before we do that, we need you to stand up, make some room, because we're gonna jump into some worship. Hey kids, let's put our hands together as we sing Greater. together. name Jesus your mighty name Everyone, we are so excited that you are here with us today. This month, we're going to be exploring the story of Esther. Now, you may think that the story of Esther is a fairy tale based on the way I'm dressed, although dressing like a princess should totally be something we can do every day. But when we take a closer look at the story, we'll be able to see that the story is not a fairy tale about a girl becoming a queen, but a story about how God can work behind the scenes with imperfect people in a challenging environment. Before we get into our Bible story today, let's start with our big answer. What is the big answer? It's the answer to the big question. This is a question that you should get from that important adult in your life, and that is, 
What did you learn in Kids Church today? And her big answer for today is God is always working. And our memory verse for this series comes from the book of Esther. And it says, who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Esther 4:14. 4, you guys probably know lots of fairy tales. Most of them probably begin with a damsel in distress and end with happily ever after. Stories like a little girl with powers to freeze things and turn them to ice, who loses her parents, grows distance from her sis distant from her sister, runs away after her powers are discovered, only to have to rely on her sister's love to rescue her. Or a mermaid who falls in love with a prince on land, who gives up her voice to an evil sea creature and has to get the prince to fall in love with her. The sea creature is destroyed and the mermaid and the prince live happily ever after. Or a girl living on an island, learning how to be the leader of her people, who has to travel across the ocean to return something stolen, meeting a shape-shifting man who reluctantly helps her and she saves her people. Like our modern fairy tales, the story of Esther is often shared as if it were a fairy tale, with a broken-hearted king who falls in love with a peasant girl who becomes queen. But the story of Esther is far from a fairy tale. Esther's story begins in a city called Susa, which was the capital of the Persian Empire. God's people, the Israelites, were living in the area because they had been placed in exile by, by the Babylonians there about 170 years before. Exile just means that when the Babylonians conquered the Israelites, the Babylonians didn't let them stay in their homeland. Eventually, though, the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians, and the Persian kings allowed the Israelites to return home. But some stayed in Persia, keeping their Jewish traditions and beliefs. Esther was one of these people. She still followed the one true God. The Persian Empire had a king, King Xerxes. He was a fearsome king. He had a bad temper and made quick decisions which affected the lives of innocent people. He once fired his queen just because she didn't show up for a party. So he needed a new queen. King Xerxes searched for a new queen for an entire year. His royal court told him to have a beauty pageant with all the beautiful unmarried women in the land and select his next queen. This sets the stage for Esther's arrival. Esther was raised by her uncle Mordecai. In Esther chapter 2 verses 7 through 8 we read, Mordecai was the legal guardian of his cousin Esther because she had no father or mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was extremely good looking. When her father and mother died, Mordecai had adopted her as his own daughter. When the king's command became public knowledge and when many young women were gathered at the fortress of Susa under Haggai's supervision, Esther was taken to the palace into the supervision of Haggai. Mordecai, Esther's cousin, told her to keep it a secret and not tell anyone that she came from a Jewish family. Esther could have been in real danger if the king didn't like what she believed. She must have been scared. Now, I think it's important to know that unlike every other book in the Bible, God is not mentioned by name in the book of Esther, and the story doesn't say anything about the Israelites being God's chosen people. But this makes Esther's story stand out as a story that's very much like ours. We don't read about Esther receiving a message from God promising to keep her safe. She has to make the joy choice to identify as one of God's people without knowing how the story is going to end. Esther faces difficult situations and choices, just like we do, and she has to decide how to respond to them. Will she blend in with her society? Will she ignore others who are in trouble? And will she trust God, even if she doesn't talk about her faith in public? As the story of Esther continues, she is taken to live in the king's palace, where she, where she is considered the king's property. She couldn't go where she wanted or fall in love and marry anyone. And this sounds kind of strange to us, but it was common in the past. After about a year, she was summoned to the king. In Esther... Chapter 2, verses 17 through 18, it says, The king loved Esther more than all the other women. She won more favor and approval from him than did any of the others. He placed the royal crown on her head and made her queen. The king held a great banquet with all of his officials and staff. It was Esther's banquet. The king chose Esther to become his queen. Even though God isn't mentioned, this one action lifts Esther to become the heroine of her story. God not being mentioned in the story isn't something that happened by accident. 
Since God isn't mentioned in the story, it forces us to look for his activity throughout the story of Esther. And when we look for it, we can see God at work through the whole story. Esther did her part God's way even in the midst of her unfair situation. God did his part by having the king choose her to be his queen. And God worked on the king so that he trusted Esther. God had a plan to use Esther again for his purposes. Sometimes it may feel like God isn't working in our situations. Maybe things aren't great at home or your grandma or grandpa is sick or your best friend is moving away. It's important to remember that God is always working, even in the hard times. We have to have faith. We have to trust in God and have confidence that he will fulfill his promises. Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. We need to spend time in our Bible so we can see how God was at work in the lives of so many people in the Bible. We can spend time in prayer, asking God to help us in our situations and for him to reveal the work that he is doing. It's also important to look back and see how he has answered prayers in the past. That is a great way to see how God is at work in our lives. We should also be open to allowing God to move in our lives every day. Maybe God wants to use you to work in someone else's life. When you get that feeling to go sit next to a new kid at lunch or invite them to play on the playground, do it. That's God giving you a nudge through the Holy Spirit to show his love to those around you. Or maybe it's helping your mom and dad with chores around the house before you're even asked. Or helping your elderly neighbor with their yard work. We need to be open to seeing how God can use us to help the people around us. God is always at work in our lives and in the lives of those around us. We just need to slow down and look for how he is working and how we can help him. Just like our big answer says, God is always working. Do you, do you guys hear that? That's an interesting noise. It's like a low growl or something? Oh boy, I hope that's not a dragon. I'm gonna, I'm definitely not dressed to fight a dragon, so I'm gonna get out of here. I'll see you guys later. It's time for Memory Verse Breakdown! Hey kids, today we're going to break down this week's Memory Verse. Are you ready? Okay, here's this week's Memory Verse. Think you've got it? Try saying it out loud. All right, let's take some words away. You think you still got it? Try saying it out loud again. All right, let's bring those words back in and see how you did. Did you get it right? Awesome! Well, that's this week's Memory Verse Breakdown. How'd you do? Memory Verse Breakdown! Yay time! Hey there, everyone! Who's ready to have a race right here, right now? Ooh, I know I am. Okay, here's how it will work. There will be five laps. Each lap requires you to answer a question about a book of the Bible. For each question, you'll be given two actions to choose from. One action represents the correct answer, and one action represents the wrong answer. If you choose the wrong action, then please take a seat and cheer your teammates on. If you choose the right answer, you're still racing and can move on to the next question. Everybody got it? Good! Go ahead and jump to your feet. Let's get this race started. To complete lap number one, you must answer this question. Is the book of Genesis from the Old Testament or the New Testament? Wave your hands over your head for Old Testament or jump up and down for New Testament.
Time's up. Genesis is in the Old Testament. If you were waving your hands, you finished the first lap. If you were jumping, please take a seat. To complete lap number two, you must answer this question. Is the book of Revelation from the Old Testament or the New Testament? Spin in a circle for Old Testament or hop on one foot for New Testament. Time's up. Revelation is in the New Testament. If you were hopping on one foot, you finished two laps. Only three more to go. Here's the question for lap number three. Is the book of Ruth from the Old Testament or the New Testament? Do jumping jacks for Old Testament or flap your arms like a bird for New Testament? Time's up. Ruth is in the Old Testament. Everyone doing jumping jacks is still in the race. All you flapping birds out there, please take a seat. Here's the question for the fourth lap. Is the book of Micah from the Old Testament or the New Testament? Spin in a circle for Old Testament or jump up and down for New Testament. Time's up. Micah is in the Old Testament. If you are spinning in circles, you are probably super dizzy, but you made it to the final lap. You've just got one more question to answer to win the race. Is the book of Jude from the Old Testament or the New Testament? Flap your arms like a bird for Old Testament or jump up and down for New Testament. Time's up. Jude is in the New Testament. If you were jumping, then you can keep jumping for joy because you just won gold. Woohoo! What an exciting race. Ooh, I'm so pumped. I think I'm going to go run a marathon. Oh, no. <laughs> except, ouch, I, I think I just pulled something. Uh, maybe I better go ice this. Anyway, congratulations to all our winners. Thanks for playing, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. Before you leave, have that important adult in your life, go to lifechurchgreenbay.com slash kids, where you can grab our Kids Connect card. There you can discuss our big answer, memory verse, and even more. We love you so much. Have a great week.